In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. My father was in the Navy, and I can imagine him telling this story to me as a child, because I recall it, and it stuck with me all this time. You may have heard the story of the naval convoy crossing through a raging sea in the middle of dark and stormy night, probably not much different than last night. The moon blocked out by the overpowering clouds with nothing but darkness. On the navigation deck, an officer saw a glimpse of light ahead. And it's on the horizon, and he reported it to the captain. In the violent storm and the tossing sea, the captain was concerned that another ship was heading straight towards them and told the communications officer to signal that ship to bear off. But the message came back, somewhat garbled by the stormy conditions, no, you bear off. The captain of the lead ship of the convoy was so alarmed that he woke the fleet admiral who was on his ship to explain the situation. The admiral jumped up out of his bunk and came to the bridge, and he saw the faint light and immediately fired off a message. This is Fleet Admiral Jonathan T.J. Kingsley, and we are approaching you with a flotilla of three 10-ton cruisers, five destroyers, and six frigates. And if you do not bear off, you will be sunk. The reply came back, Sir, this is Seaman First Class Sam Smith, and I'm in a lighthouse. You bear off. <laughs> to change one's course in life, can be a dramatic and sometimes painful undertaking. But the change is better than the fatal landing at the end. And this is the problem that Nicodemus is having. Jesus tells Nicodemus that he is facing a fatal landing if he does not change directions. But Nicodemus knows only why, one way, and that is the way of the world. And that's the only way that most of us know. But Jesus appears on the scene and began, began speaking of heaven, of being born from above, of being born anew, or being born again, all translated the same way. And Nicodemus hears these words, you must be born again. And he is confused. And so he asks, how can a person go back into the mother's womb and be born a second time, be born again? Now, Nicodemus was a cream of the Jewish crop. One could not dream of having a better life than he has. He was a Jew, a Pharisee, a member of the Sanhedrin, the highest legal, legislative, and judicial body of the Jews, and a highly respected teacher of the Old Testament scriptures. Can you imagine being Nicodemus and having Jesus from the backwoods of Galilee tell you that all of this is not enough to get you into the kingdom of God? Yet this is precisely what Jesus tells Nicodemus. If a man like Nicodemus is not good enough for the kingdom of God, then who is? It is surprising that Nicodemus is so confused. He's a religious leader and should understand spiritual lessons, but somehow he must feel that he has missed some crucial truth, and he comes in the dark of night seeking to be enlightened searching for something to change his life. Peter Gomes, the late Harvard Divinity School professor and Pusey minister at Harvard Memorial Church, wrote in his book, The Good Book, Reading the Bible in Mind and Heart, about being born again. He writes, what born again means is literally to begin all over again to be given a second birth, a second chance. The one who's born again doesn't all of a sudden turn into a super Christian. To be born again is to enter afresh into the process of spiritual growth. It is to wipe the slate clean. It is to cancel out your old mortgage and start again. In other words, you don't have to be always what you are, have now become. Such an offer is too good to be true for many, confusing for most, but for those who seek to be other than what they are now and who want to be more 
than the mere accumulation and sum total of their experiences, the invitation, you must be born again, is an offer you cannot afford to refuse. An offer you cannot afford to refuse. Now, what is this born again or born from above that Jesus is talking about? Do we as Episcopalians believe all this stuff about born again? It sounds like it might be too evangelical for us. I've always found when I'm preaching that if the words are repeated in a scripture lessons, that perhaps it is an important point. In John, the word born is repeated eight times in six verses. Maybe we should sit up and pay attention to what Jesus is saying. Our Book of Common Prayer certainly does. The baptismal service, which incorporates us through our confession of faith into the church, includes those challenging words, born again. Where, you say? Well, during the thanksgiving over the water, the celebrant says, we thank you, Father, for the water of baptism. We are all buried with Christ in his death. By it, we share in his resurrection. And through it, we are reborn by the Holy Spirit. And as the priest touches the water and makes the sign of the cross to bless it, the following words are said, Now sanctify this water, we pray you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that those who are here are cleansed from sin and born again may continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Who are cleansed from sin and born again may continue forever. Immediately following the blessing, the person is baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, in the name of the Trinity, which we celebrate this Sunday. The Reverend Canon Marianne Borg puts it another way. She says, let me describe what I think being born from above or being born again is like. Jesus refers to things of the everyday, Things that are here and now, like the lilies of the fields, the birds of the air, the mustard seed, the withered grass with the fading flower. And then he would tell a story about them. And you would see them from a slightly different angle. The meaning would pour out of them. It's like Jesus saw things from the inside out. I suggest that being born again, to see something and then to see it again. And then meaning pours out from the inside out. The meaning that the heart sees and knows and ordinary things become full of awe and wonder, unexpectedly and humble. She concludes by saying, being born again helps us to see. Now, we know that Nicodemus was transformed by coming face to face with Jesus. We may not fully know from this reading in the third chapter of John, but I believe Nicodemus was born again. Nicodemus is mentioned three times in the fourth gospel. Later in the seventh chapter, when the Pharisees and the high priest are trying to arrest Jesus, they send the temple guards to arrest him but they return empty-handed because they were afraid of the crowds. When the religious leaders began to berate the guards, it was Nicodemus who reminded them that it was illegal to arrest Jesus on hearsay evidence. They needed to hear Jesus firsthand. And because of Nicodemus' question, the religious leaders could not arrest Jesus at that time. But the last time we hear about Nicodemus, is really after Jesus' crucifixion, and it's in the 19th chapter. We all know that Joseph of Arimathea goes to Pilate to ask for Jesus' body so he could bury him. But Nicodemus goes with him and brings spices and herbs to anoint, to anoint the body for burial. Nicodemus is changed. He no longer comes in the dark of night. When other followers run away, Nicodemus comes forward in the bright sun of the day, a bright uh, daylight, though it's dangerous, and makes himself known to Pilate. Born again? 
I think so. Nicodemus, for some, became the icon of born again, of changing, of seeing things anew. On April 18th of 1877, a group of seven, six of whom were black, established the Nicodemus Town Company in Kansas. Historian Daniel Burke notes that to blacks after the Civil War, Nicodemus was a model of rebirth, so they sought to cast off their old identity as enslaved. Two African-American clergy, William Smith and Thomas Harris, along with W.R. Wright, a land speculator, served as the town's presidents and treasurers, respectively. And, but most of the group consisted of enslaved people from Kentucky in search for freedom and a new livelihood. The goal was to establish the first all-black settlement on the Great Plains. Professor Rodman of St. Mary's College in Los Angeles asserts that the freed slaves who moved to Nicodemus, Kansas after the Civil War named their town after him. And the initial group of 30 arrived, followed by another 350 shortly thereafter. They would arrive at the end of the railroad line in Ellis, Kansas, and walk a remaining 35 miles to be at the town. And within five years, Nicodemus, Kansas had a newspaper, a hotel, two churches, and was a thriving community. Remember the words that Tonya read so beautifully? For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness to our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. This weekend, an event was to have been held to commemorate an incident that occurred a hundred years ago, with John Legend performing in the keynote speech by Stacy Abrams. It has been canceled. You saw the front page article in the New York Times or read the New York Times Magazine this Sunday. So you are aware that I'm talking about an event called Remember and Rise, the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa race massacre in Oklahoma that left between 100 and 300 dead, 800 people treated for injuries, 35 city blocks in charcoal ruins, and more than 1,200 homes and businesses destroyed, including churches and schools, even a hospital and library and countless lives scarred and shattered forever. You see, following World War I, Tulsa was recognized nationally for its affluent African-American community referred to as Black Wall Street and the Greenwood section of Tulsa. Even now, a hundred years later, the full truth is not known as the mass graves are being discovered. And little, if any, relief or insurance coverage was received by the African-American victims of this racial massacre. Not even the three remaining survivors, who are each over 100 years old, and recently testified before the House Judiciary Subcommittee on Constitution, Civil Rights, and Civil Liberties. Now, why do I mention this horrific event on this holiday weekend as we celebrate Trinity Sunday and Memorial Day weekend, and when it would be so much easier to reminisce about cookouts with family as we began our first long weekend of the summer season. I do so because that is what we all need to do. We need to remember and follow the example of Nicodemus to be born again, to see things differently as Jesus sees them, to be broken open with the same incredulous questions that Nicodemus asked as he looked into Jesus' eyes. Once one truly looks into the eyes of Jesus, it is difficult to turn away without being changed, to be born again. If you don't believe that, then ask the long parade of witnesses. Ask Mary Magdalene, who would say, yes, it's true. 
I looked into his face at the tomb and I became the first evangelist to tell others that he lives. Asked Matthew who would answer, I looked into his face, though a dishonest tax collector, and I became an honest man. Asked Paul who would reply, when I met Jesus, I changed. My zeal for the new law has become a zeal for love. Or ask Peter, who denied him, changed, you ask? Oh, yes, I changed. After I met Jesus, I had to wrestle with my prejudices against the Gentiles and to accept them as brothers and sisters. We're all broken men and women, and our need is to be healed, changed, repaired, forgiven. True questions that are asked need true answers. And the true question for this morning is not, what was Nicodemus searching for? But what are you searching for in this confusing world? Is it possibly to be born again? I close with a prayer for Nicodemus, adapted from Sarah Thalger. Let us pray. God of second chances, who is patient with our confusion and who leads us into greater understanding, if only we have ears to hear and souls willing to search, grant that we may be born anew each day into hope, born anew each day into joy, born anew into your realm. When we become legalistic in our living, Teach us the language of forgiveness. When we become concrete in our thinking, lift us into the ways of your spirit. When we become stuck in religious patterns that lead us away from you, bring us back to a living faith. And in your grace, have remind us that the last words spoken to Nicodemus by Jesus, God so loved the world, that he gave his only son, that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have life eternal. Amen. Amen. Amen.